coming up, I check out some 128k game differences. I play some more games. Jeff reviews a next game. I chat to Alan and end with a type in. Let's get on then. When the Spectrum 1-8 was released in 1985, the games playing public were eager to see what the extra features of this machine would bring to games. Following the Plus 2 in 1986, the Plus 3 arrived in 1987, given as a mass storage device as well. Again, what would the companies use this for? Sadly, we were initially disappointed. Most companies were lazy and just threw out 48k games on disc, or even worse, bundled a load of older 48k titles into a compilation. Yes, the games loaded quicker, but there was no extra value and no difference to their 48k counterparts. Over time though, software houses began to release titles that were different, even if the public failed to notice or the company themselves failed to advertise them. Having glanced through the games with differences, it's surprising just how many there were, and I certainly didn't realise there were that many. Some added AY sound, some added more graphics and some added intros, but let's just have a quick skip through. I'm not going to go through every single game that has a difference, otherwise we'd be here all day. So let's take a quick rummage. Starting with adventure games then. Shadows of Mordor from Melbourne House. A nice text adventure on a 48k machine. However, on the plus three, we get 40 illustrated locations. The 48k version had the illustrations on a separate tape if you wanted to view them. Several Rainbow Adventures had 1 to 8k or disc improvements as well, including Nighthawk that benefited from location graphics on the disc version and more verbose text. Level 9 also re-released some of their earlier titles with improvements for 1 to 8k users. Fairlight gave the user some new monsters, AY sound and a new crypt to explore, and all three Magic Knight games had 1 to 8k versions with more rooms. and HeroQuest added on-screen graphics. How about racing games then? Well, Road Blasters, a 48k version, gave us a very empty looking landscape, without too much feel for speed. The 1 to 8k version added stripes to give a better feeling. Supercars provided a very dull interface if you had 48k, however the 1 to 8k versions had a nice makeover for the garage and office. Lotus Turbo Spree Challenge gave us a nice intro with some facts about the car itself. On to fighting games then, and this seemed to attract a lot of attention for 1 to 8k developers. Double Dragon 2 had major changes, switching from this poor 48k small windowed game onto this full screen 128k beat em up. Yeah, Kung Fu had some new enemies, and Renegade had an extra level and a shoulder throw move added. Some other 1 to 8k games included Daily Thompson Super Test. Now this game gave us a lot more if you had 128k. The 48k version included 8 events, and the disc version gave us 12. The extra ones were Javelin, Triple Jump, 110m Hurdles, and 100m Sprint. Rasputin gave us a weird talking head. I am Rasputin. <laughs> and Amarot had some cutscenes and a nice intro. Eswat took the squashed half-screen game and brings it onto full screen for 1 to 8k owners. And Days of Thunder includes better graphics for the cutscenes and for the crash scenes. After the War had a nice intro on the disc, and Shadow of the Beast had graphics for each level on the disc version only. 
Three Weeks in Paradise had more locations, and Mystical had this lovely intro. What about more modern games then? Well, Bobby Carrot had a larger playing area on run to 8k machines, and a great game it is too. And Retro Invaders had background graphics and great AY sound. There are a lot more games with differences, and like I say, I haven't gone through every single one. But I was amazed at just how many there were, and I wonder how many of you knew that there were that many as well. And how much you've missed out if you had 1 to 8k machines, and were still playing those 48k versions. I was surprised at the many differences to be found, although they could be just slotted into extra sound, extra rooms or extra graphics. But then again, what else could you do with a game? Some of these games are now loaded onto my GoTech and ready to be enjoyed whenever I need to have a beat em up, a drive around or a shoot. Be sure to check some of them out if you've got 1 to 8k machines, or indeed switch your emulator to 128k and make sure you're loading the right files. Afterburner was released into the arcades by Sega in 1987, with some cabs being sit-in that rotated and tilted with the action. Impressive 3D visuals and a great soundtrack made this a firm favourite with arcade goers, and even now at retro events it's hard to find a cab empty. Could this game appear on the spectrum? Well, let's see. In 1988, Activision released the game for the 48k and 128k machines, including a disc version, and this will be the one I'm reviewing here. The game came in a large box, with a nice selection of additions. There was a large poster, a leaflet to enter a competition to win a flight on Concord, a sticker, and a manual, along with a tape or disc. On to the game then. Before you start, you can pick the controls and decide if you want to play with music or sound effects. Sadly, not both. Taking off from an aircraft carrier, you pilot your F-14 Tomcat with a mission to... Well, there's nothing about missions in the mission briefing booklet, which is weird. But looking at the arcade machine, you have to clear all the enemy fighters from all the areas. And this is done by using cannons or missiles. The arcade game had two separate fire buttons for this. The Spectrum, though, uses one button for missiles, with the plane seemingly firing the cannon continuously. The lock-on icon appears if your fighter locks on to an enemy aircraft, and if you have sound effects, you will hear the sound. The problem is, if you have the music on, you can't hear the lock-on sound effect, so you have to keep looking at the control panel to see if the warning message is flashing, which then distracts you from flying. There is no speech on the Spectrum version like the arcade, but the action is fast, and to be honest, the screen can get so full of stuff it's impossible to see what's going on. The graphics are monochrome, with a split paper effect for land and sea. Your fighter looks okay and moves well enough, even doing barrel rolls. Ground textures are poor, with very little detail but you're not on a sightseeing mission here. The enemy planes come thick and fast, firing at you as they head towards you or approach you from the rear. Staying still is a bad idea, so you have to keep moving to avoid getting hit. You spend most of the game flipping from left to right of the screen and up and down just to avoid being shot by enemy planes. You have limited ammo too, so you should really fire when you hear the lock-on sound or see the lock-on alert message. The sound effects are poor, for a 128k machine, there's no cannon fire, and the missile and explosion effects leave you underwhelmed. The music is okay though, but can sound a little out of tune depending on which song is playing. If you can get further, the colours change, representing different landscapes, but the gameplay remains the same. Dodge, fire, and hope you don't get unlucky.
frequently you can refuel and rearm, either from a refueling plane or landing on an airstrip. If you're really good, unlike me, you can get to different sections, like flying through a canyon, although it's not that impressive to be honest, and reminds me a little bit of Thunderblade. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I began playing the Spectrum version after having a go on the arcade one. It felt a bit empty and a bit void of atmosphere, but the action was certainly up to speed. The graphics were, at times, impossible to interpret because there was so much going on on screen. If you loved the arcade game and wanted something similar on your Spectrum back in the day, you may have really enjoyed this. Looking at it now though, it's a good title, but I'm not sure it uses everything the Spectrum can offer. Crystal Castles was released into the arcades by Atari in 1983 and features Bentley Bear collecting gems in a 3D castle. To progress you collect all the gems in each castle and avoid the chasing enemies. Control on the arcade machine, at least using MAME, is tricky due to the 3D view and the graphics were chunky but with some nice tunes and sound effects. The Spectrum version was released by US Gold in 1986, and the first thing you notice is the lack of sound. All you get are a few tunes, but apart from that the game plays in silence. Why? In 1986 the Spectrum Plus 2 was out, and it had an AY chip, so why no in-game sound? It's a mystery. The control is still awkward, and takes some getting used to. and you do need good control to be able to negotiate the many stairs, lifts and passages in the levels. The lifts take you up or down to different ledges, and doorways take you through the castle to other rooms or the other side, and the passageways lead you onto paths that vanish around the back or through the castle structure. When you do vanish, the graphics turn into a sort of outline, which in one way is useful, but it does look very poor. The castles are drawn in monochrome, and look almost like the arcade versions, however there are no lifts on the first level like the arcade, but they do appear later on. The level design is good, but it can be tricky to work out the more complex designs and find the right route. The graphics for me don't hold the same charm as the arcade machine, and they move in character squares. Really? In 1986 the programmers couldn't get pixel movement into a game? There's also no animation on the main character Bentley Bear, or some of the chasing enemies, which is poor. I had a look at the RZX playback to see later levels, and they do look challenging, but overall I was disappointed with this game. Given that Night Law was released three years earlier, and 3D engines had improved since then, to release a game with character movement seems a backward step. A game then to be played by fans of the original but others may find it frustrating, and the lack of in-game sound and the character movement makes the game look like it was released in 1983. This is Ant Eater, released by DEFB Studios in 2021. Ant Eater was an arcade game released in 1982, and was one of those games you played when all of the good games were taken up. The Spectrum version has only just been converted. It had a strange premise, in that you controlled the tongue of an ant eater trying to eat ants. You stood at the top of the screen, with a warren of tunnels beneath you, through which ran ants and other things. Controlling your exceptionally long tongue, you have to navigate the tunnels and grab the ants and eat their larva. There were, however, things to avoid, like worms, that killed you if you eat them head first, and spiders that travel along your tongue, stopping you from retracting it, eventually killing you when it reached the end.
Extending and retracting your tongue is an integral part of the game, and so is speed. You have to get all the lava as fast as possible. At the very bottom of the screen are queen ants, and eating these will clear any worms or ants from the level. For a short period of time anyway. And if that wasn't enough, if an ant hits your tongue, you lose a life. You have to catch them with the tip of the tongue only. The game is exceptionally well written, and looks very much like the arcade version. Control is great, making it a joy to play, and the sound and music feel just right. An excellent game then, definitely one to get. Hello, today we're going to take a look at Galaxy of Errors. Galaxy of Errors is by Steve Monks, that's the coding and the graphics, with audio by Noise by Night. This is a completely free game, and on the website it's described as a labour of love. In the game you play Spaceman Dan, and must guide him around the levels collecting fuel for his ship, then return to your ship to fly off to the next level. Once moving, Dan will continue to move until he hits something, or is lost in the starry, inky blackness of space. In later levels, one or more droids are available, which Dan can control to help him collect fuel and then return to his ship. On even later levels, satellites appear, which can't be controlled but can be shunted by Dan or one of the droids to help him collect his fuel and get back to the ship. On even later levels than that, there are further dangers such as electric arcs, which will instantly kill Dan or a droid. Losing Dan or a droid into one of these, or the blackness of space, means Dan loses a life. To answer the fun, Dan has a limited oxygen supply that continually decreases, serving as a time limit for each level. Dan can collect additional oxygen in some levels, which will increase the time limit for that level. In traditional gaming fashion, Dan has three lives. Once a level is completed, Dan can start again from that level and starting a new game. There are also score bonuses when a level is completed under a certain time. One great thing about this game is that it works on C-Spec straight out of the box, which is a great bonus for those without an Next, or who have an Next but like to try a game out on an emulator first. Galaxy of Errors reminds me of one of my favourite homebrew GBA games, Jomo in that it has chunky, really good looking graphics, it has a very good, really well animated gameplay, and it has really good sound. Now I like a puzzle game, and this is one of the best that I've played on the next. It's kind of a Sokoban clone, hence my comparison to Jomo, with the added twist that Dan himself will move until he hits something. The introduction of the droids, doors, satellites and deadly rays in later levels helps to keep the game feeling fresh and challenging. When I first played this game, the thing that really struck me was how well presented it was. The intro screen has a really crisp look to it, as does the rest of the game. It looks really professional, and for a free game that's really really good and an added bonus. The first few levels aren't too difficult, and serve as a kind of tutorial on how to play the game, but the difficulty soon ramps up. One thing I'll say about the difficulty curve is that it can be a bit up and down. One level can be really challenging, but the next few can be relatively easy. Although that does give some relief from the really hard level that you've just completed. Another criticism is I would say that the time limit can seem really short, particularly on later levels that are more complex. For that, you can start again from any level that you previously completed, go somewhere to compensate for this, but still, it can be really frustrating when you're looking around a level and have nearly completed it and your time runs out. One thing that you may find in some levels is that you get yourself into a situation that you can't get out of. You've got to be really careful when you're looking around the levels and working out how to do the level. It's very, very easy to get yourself stuck and then you've just got to restart that level, losing a life in the process. 
What can compound that is that when controlling the droids, you cycle round the droids and Dan, and sometimes you'll choose the wrong droid and move the wrong droid, meaning that you can no longer complete the level. Even with these criticisms, this is a fantastic game. When I first played this, I found myself playing it for quite some time. It's kind of another more go level. You just think, oh, I'll just get through one more level, I'll just get through one more level, and keep going until you've got quite far into the game. Later levels do become really, really challenging. There are 30 levels in the game, and so far I've managed to get to level 22. I'm hoping one day to complete them all. So that's Galaxy of Errors, a great game, and as I say, it's free, so why not go and download it and give it a go? Even if you don't have an X, you can play it on C-Spec. So until next time, happy gaming! Going on to one of your uh, modern games, mm -hmm. a game that you've released as a full thing, uh, The Perils of Willy, yes. which was released in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about that? How did that come about? Well, I guess like like a lot of Spectrum fans, I've always been a fan of those Manic Miner games, especially you know at the time. I hope I won't get any pelters for saying I think they're a little bit dated now, but I, I certainly enjoyed them at the time. I wrote an editor for Manic Miner myself in about 85 something like that 86 it was it was a fun thing and it was always something i wanted to to go to go back to if you like to do something mm. like that and i and then i um i got hold of the source code for uh for manic miner and at that point i'd already learned quite a lot of assembly language working with an original source code is a really fun way to learn assembly language you know where you can because you know you can try things you've got something that works and you can sort of tinker with it change a few things and so you know I had to play about with with those and I was also thinking about this game on the Vic 20 Perils of Willy which is um, a terrible game really to be honest yeah. right yeah, I was going to it's, say it was released on the Vic was, was that yeah. the only Willy game to be released uh, that officially had, uh, had yeah. a Spectrum release yeah, yeah officially it was the only one and um, it's very slow and it's kind of clunky but when I was looking at it, I thought, you know what? Actually, though, this game, there might be a game in here. You know, there might be a reasonably fun game in here underneath. But if I was to port this over to the Spectrum, then um, it could be quite good. And, and uh, so when I tried porting the graphics over, it turned out that uh, you could sort of, the resolution was, was obviously different and it looked a lot more mm. like a Manic Miner game. You couldn't sort of adapt it directly to the Manic Miner engine because of the, the scale. The window of the Manic Miner mm. engine uses the top two thirds and the, th the bottom third is just for the lives and stuff, whereas this one would have had to have been bigger. So at the time, I didn't know too much about assembly, so I started writing it in, in AGD. And yeah. of course, when I did that and I played it, I was like, well, this looks okay, but it plays like an AGD game, right? That is not what Manic Miner is all about. You know when sometimes people make a remake or they do something, they use a different engine and it just doesn't feel right, yeah? But uh, I'm surprised nobody did it before because, you know, Minor Willy is an icon on the spectrum and if there are games out there that's not been converted, I mean, somebody converted the one that was on the Scion 3 or whatever it was. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the Horace games because it, Horace, again, is another character and there wasn't a version of it on the spectrum, so yes. somebody did it. Um, so you'd have thought that this one would have been crying out to do it. Well, uh, there had been people talking about it, but and that was one of the interesting things because one of the things I read was that somebody said, oh, it's impossible. You'd never be able to do it because the engine is different and it's a different size mm -hmm. screen and you, you wouldn't be able to adapt the Manic Miner engine to, uh, to do it without you know rewriting the whole thing. So I thought, well, hold my beer, right? <laughs> so I thought, let's give it a go. Why not, right? <laughs> It's a fair point. Obviously, it was a, it was going to be a challenge, but I thought, well, let's have a go because I've got the source code. I, I feel like my assembly knowledge is um, enough to do it. So let me see if I can just change the screen size and, and, and adapt the code in that way. And I was able to use a few compression techniques and various other bits and pieces enough to, to kind of 
figure it out. And basically do this do the manic miner engine and then draw the last sort of three or four rows at the end yeah. separately if you like but as far as the player was concerned it would, they would they would look the same and at that point i realized well if i can crack this i can i can do it the levels um are fairly straightforward and um yeah and i had a little bit of help got a couple of other people the, the credits are all in the on the game itself but there was a few people chipped in to help me to design the levels let's say to copy them over mm. um, so did, did you do a did you do a one for one copy of the vic game then more or less yeah more or less mm. what I, well what i did is i got uh, there's a guy called richard hallas who's very well known in the in the sort of manic minor modding community he'd he did some of the very early mods and he's a regular sort of uh, contributor and a huge fan of of the game so i brought him in as a kind of consultant if you like you know i mean yeah. i'm not obviously it wasn't like a pro thing i was just it was more like hi richard can you help yeah sure no problem that's how it was so i because i thought you know what I need, if i'm going to do this if if he's happy then the rest of the community is probably going to be happy there's probably yeah. going to be one or two people that aren't that will that will think that it shouldn't be done but you know it's fun isn't it let's give it a go so This is Odyssey 1, released by Perfection Software in 1983. It was later released by Softstone, and this is the version I have. This game is a sort of mix between Berserk, Robotron, Arcadia, and Phoenix, and it has three separate stages. There is a story behind this, but it takes longer to read the story than it does to lose all your lives and have to start again. First you start off in a maze, and you have to destroy all of the robots. The control method is rotate and move, with firing done in the direction of travel. You can destroy the white blobs, but this doesn't progress you through the game. You have to take out all of the robots. If, and that's a big if, you can do this, then you can move on to the next stage, a shoot 'em up. Here you have to shoot the ships as they move from left to right, and there's a lot of them. Each time you hit a ship, it generates a missile that drops straight down, which remains there for the rest of the level, which makes things very difficult. This level reminded me very much of Arcadia. If you can get past this, which I could never do without cheating, then you get to the final stage. And here we get to a stage like the Phoenix level with flapping birds. The control is terrible, with a lag from the key press to the game responding, and this means you fail to line up the shot or go crashing into a wall. Graphics are 8 pixels square, and movement is in the same 8 pixels, which makes things very jerky. Sound is used really well though, but control is just too sticky to make the game enjoyable. It soon becomes frustrating after you crash into the wall for the 20th time, or get killed immediately after losing a life, because the robot responsible just keeps shooting. One for the experts only then. Yes, we're back in Typing Corner, and this episode we're going to take a look at Maze and Chase, written by Jay Southgate and published in Popular Computing Weekly in January 1984. It was Program of the Week, and the listing took up about three quarters of a page. After typing it out, the first attempt to play failed because variable was not found. With that quickly fixed, it produced several more problems. First, the man could not move down, and this was a simple mistype by myself. Next you could have a minus count on the spades, meaning you could dig as many holes as you like, which we'll get onto shortly. That was fixed as well. And then there was this tricky weird character here. I thought it was a UDG that hadn't been typed in properly, but it turned out to be an inline inverted copyright. Hmm, okay. With those fixed, we can now play the game.
you have to collect the dots and avoid the invader. If you collect a spade, you can dig a hole, and if the invader falls in, you can fill it in. He'll be soon back though, so you have to be quick. The movement is continuous, so when you press to go left, you will keep going left until you change direction. This is a fairly simple version of Space Panic really, but it's quite playable. There was a few other problems that I fixed, whereby the invader removed the dots sometimes, meaning you couldn't complete the level because the game counts how many dots you've collected. And a slight problem where the invader could walk through the walls. This is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published, and it will be available to download from my website shortly.